And there we are. The numbers are going up. That means we're recording. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sustaniacs. I am Mike Vincent. I am the Sustaniac. Easy for me to say. Sustaniac. Every episode. My guest Sustaniac, but he is a Sustaniac in real life, is Mike Schwartz. Directly off his deathbed, folks. <laughs> Not quite that bad. Not quite that bad. But, uh, dude, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, how are you feeling? You doing better? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. That is fantastic. So Mike Schwartz is the acting uh, director of sustainability for Republic Services right now. And uh, dude, welcome to the show, brother. How are you? Yeah, thanks so much. It's great to be here. I, uh, I'm glad that I'm up and running after a, a, a light illness, but it uh, uh, doesn't take the steam away. And I'm still no, 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 no. And, and here's the thing, man. Once you jump into and people, you know, I've been 36 years in logistics, right? And the joke has always been, well, it's not really a joke. It's almost true. But uh, you get into logistics and you can never leave. It's this addictive type of a new puzzle every day. And what I have found is jumping into sustainability, I can't leave it. There's so much to be done. There's so much blue ocean of opportunity and things to, to happen. Um it's insane. Before we get into Republic Services, everybody's going, okay, the garbage guys. We'll get into all that kind of stuff. What, Mike, led you to get into sustainability? How did you get dumped into this? Or did you wake up and, and you know, you're two years old and your first words were recycle that, bomb? What I mean, how'd you yeah, jump in? Uh, it, it, that, it's, it's interesting that you say recycle that, mom. I actually grew up in a house where my mom taught me recycling. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Me, I grew up in Connecticut, a state with a bottle bill, a bottle deposit. You get money for your returns. And yeah. though I didn't know the term reverse vending machine when I was uh, four years old, maybe the first time that I went with my mom in a, a bag of bottles to the grocery store, yeah, I would sit. And if I collected the bottles, I got the five cents per bottle. And I uh, had the economic motivation and the responsibility motivation to be a good citizen growing see, up. That, place, that's, so. that's awesome. Yeah. That's, Cause yeah. you know, my, you know, the, you see the memes, you know, Gen X, this was our GoFundMe, and you see a kid with a, with a, with a, uh, with a lawnmower. And that's true. I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, the snow belt East, East of Cleveland, right at the beginning of the snow belt. And I, I mowed lawns and I shoveled driveways. That's how I made money. Um, I didn't know anything about recycling, never heard about recycling. I don't even think it was a thing then. It was just, hey, don't throw stuff out the out the window was basically it. Uh trying to clean up America's highways. So you were your your first entrepreneur job was recycling, was picking up bottles. That's cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. And I from mean, there it was just born, huh? Girl, I mean, I grew up in a setting surrounded by trees with water nearby. I spent my childhood outdoors and when it was time to think about the world and what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand what the problems were that were facing us. I studied economics in my undergrad, and that's when a friend pointed out economy, ecology, it's resource management. One's looking at natural resources, one's looking at currency, but they're very interrelated disciplines. And a course called Natural Resource and Environmental Economics led me to have the conversations to see what paths were out there. I went to grad school for the environment, didn't think that that was um, going to blow up the way that it did and that the demand would be there. But from grad school, a small environmental startup, carbon offset credit, software to manage risks related to climate change. I worked for EcoVadis, the sustainability ratings agency, moved from there into consulting and then consulting in-house at Republic where through all of that, I've been helping organizations find value by doing the right thing. It's not that the organizational motivations aren't necessarily do <clears throat> aren't necessarily do the right thing because it is right. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But it's if you do the right thing, it's risk mitigation. If you are yeah, if, yeah, if you're doing the well, wrong I mean, thing, someone's going to find out about it, and it's going to reflect poorly on you. Yeah. Well, do the right thing even when no one's looking, Mike. Your mom, I'm sure, taught you that. That's character. That's that's what you should be doing. But, you, you know, I, I see, you know, from a very early age, it goes, I mean, Columbia University uh, economics, that's your undergrad. And then what is it? Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara uh, for your, what do you got? A master's in environmental science and management, right? And economics. Okay. So, and then from there, you, you've got this, 
your whole career has been in sustainability. So economics and sustainability, and you hit on it just a, a bit there. So unpack that just just a little bit because that's yeah. that's something that people are starting to realize now. Is is it's not um, you know back in the day we called them tree huggers. <laughs> sure. In this in the seventies and eighties, screaming about acid rain and all this other kind of stuff, right? But it's gone from this from this fringe type of thing, really, and it, it really has to. There's blue oceans of of economic viability and and business opportunities within the environment, and you know, it, it just strikes me because. When I uh, I applied to uh, uh, graduate school at Columbia, okay, and when I did my application, I had to write an essay on Alfred North Whitehead, and uh, the 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 quote was, "A society is only as great as its men and women of business place on their contributions towards that society," yeah. and. And and that's kind of what we're seeing right now, right? Is is and to me that really means that you can make a business model, a capitalistic business model, out of doing the right thing. Is is that your experience? Is that what you're seeing there when you combine that economics and environmental science and 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 so on? Yeah, I, that is absolutely the case. I mean, the the term tree hugger is a term that is sometimes thrown out as an epithet and or as a well, you're not really serious about our shareholder responsibility, our legal fiduciary duty. Yeah, no, I mean, it, meant, and, it was a derogatory term and meant to be like you're you 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 live in a commune and therefore you're a socialist and and you know we should all just can't we all just get along type of thing in anti capitalism? But that's not the case anymore, right? I mean, it, it, there there's a huge amount of overlap. If if it's the if business forgets to pay attention to natural resources and risks, that is a huge loss for long-term shareholder value. There is no entity today that can have a serious view of long-term growth and just ignore environmental degradation, ignore the risk of physical things that will happen to their assets with the increasing extreme weather events and and this is more, this is happening constantly. There was just a survey a couple of weeks ago of, we've heard it before, millennial and even more so Gen Z professionals mm -hmm. yeah. will either leave an employer or choose not to take an offer with an employer who they think is irresponsible. And it goes hand in hand where if you want to gobble up talent, if you want to have the best minds, you need to do something that those people will engage with. Yeah. And you know, it, it, the, the thing is, is that those, um, those impacts and those generational changes and, and I, they're, they're filtering up the, the, uh, the generational chart, right? If, if you consider, uh, you know, baby boomers at the top right now and then Gen Xers and so on and so forth, that's what I mean by direction. It, it, my, I'm a Gen Xer. Right, and I'm really on the verge of a baby boomer, and it, it it's like 63 percent of my generations are buying into this stuff, right? And we're the gen we didn't even have seat belts when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah, you know there was nothing. There was no such thing as unleaded gas. <laughs> you got full lead, bro. <laughs> yeah, you had a carburetor and an exhaust pipe and a couple pistons in between. That's it. <laughs> when, I, when I was driving, when we were driving cars, uh, and and but the change is 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 unbelievable. And uh, all joking aside, I, I contend really that, and I don't think it's that that much of a stretch. And I think people are starting what they're starting to realize is what you're saying there is basically good common sense business practice is sustainable. Absolutely. Right? It is sustainability. It, it, if you drive sustainability and ESG in your company, that hits your HR department, your procurement department, your operations department or manufacturing and distribution and, and, and your facilities and everything, right? I mean, it encompasses the whole business plan in a positive way if you throw it up against a board and mission of ESG, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's something that just to, to talk about Republic where I'm sitting to where, where 
I'm sitting today professionally, our CEO, who's been at the company for, for quite a few years, before he came to the company, he came from McKinsey. He, he came from business mindset. He came from talking companies through strategic problems. And when he moved into the CEO role at Republic, after years of already being in, in the company, he it was a, a, a understood transition. His vision that he's enacted is putting sustainability front and center. That the the way that he has spoken about our company on on CNBC is there was a time when Republic Services was known as a you said garbage company, a waste company, and then we came to talk about I, 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 and I oh, say no, that, and I say that because you're, it's that like that there is no that that is the way that the company talked about itself. So well, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's, that's yeah. it grew. It was a garbage company, it was a waste company, and that's probably where the majority of the people still see it. Is just oh, they just they haul waste, and, and that evolution, waste, waste and recycling. Then it was recycling and waste, which like okay, maybe you're looking at it, that's a marketing decision to have that change. As we grew our environmental services business, especially with the, um all the environmental solutions that came through our acquisition of U.S. Ecology, those words came to be our business. But today, our CEO talks about us as a sustainability company. When someone has material that they want to offload, they could say, make it as cheap as possible for me to get rid of it, full stop. Or they can yep. say, do something better with it. Invest in getting more value out of this material. And quite frankly, when I say invest in getting more value out of this material, that might have nothing to do with what our customers who have us collect their 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 materials they don't want anymore, and their price might not change, but we can find more value. Whether that's there's many innovations that I think you 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 you're gonna dive into a little bit, but yeah, hundred percent. No, we can all dive. We can dive into it. Yeah. yeah, that 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 is fantastic stuff. So let's let's just let's just take that cue and transition right into this. All right. So now. You, you, you've been through the other stuff and, and holy cow, we're going to have to come back and talk about lecturing at ASU and we're going to have to talk about uh, FLAG and we're going to have to talk about Ecovado and we're going to have to talk about the ESG CSR board and all that kind of stuff. But let's, let's, let's jump all the way forward to present day. What in the heck is the director of sustainability at Republic? What does Republic do and what is your role there? Yeah, so... Republic's business is finding the best way to manage materials that someone doesn't want anymore. Some of those materials are what you put in the trash bag. Some of those materials are household and commercial recyclables. Some of those are hazardous materials. But for each of those streams, someone is saying, okay, we just want to get rid of it. Maybe we want to get rid of it specifically responsibly. Maybe you, can you be our partner to help us keep as much out of landfill as possible. So, so that's what we hear from some of our customers. But the bottom line is someone wants to get rid of something and we're helping them do that. Mm -hmm. We say the most value that we can bring to our own organization, to our own shareholders is by finding the way to put the, the least amount of waste. And when I say waste, I mean loss, least amount, but find the most efficient way to handle these materials so that that value remains in circulation. So yeah, absolutely. Even absolutely. Even if we're just talking about landfills, landfills once were a very different thing than they are today. Oh, today yeah. They are yeah. highly engineered. A landfill is a constructed project where there is a line, there, there is a foundation of a landfill. There's a liner. There are different elements of constructing the landfill it is not an open pit. There's not garbage flying around the top. It, um, there's active monitoring of all the material of, of all of the possible ways that it could be polluting or damaging the environment and treating the um, the, re the what what comes off the effluent. The, the leachate is what it's called when water passes through waste. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, because you, you've got to do that because you got to protect the water tables around it and also the emissions, right? Capping it and stuff like that. And there's, there, there are, are, are there, are there economic opportunities for what you call the, what is it, the leachate or the, the, that's coming out leachate. of them leachate. as well as the, as well as the emissions? Cause I know you can yeah. cap it and grab the methane, et cetera, and use that for fuel. Yeah. Can you do that to the liquid as well or what? So, whether you can or can't, and can or can't is often 
not a technological question, but an economic mm. feasibility question. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That isn't that isn't the place where innovation has found the biggest opportunities today for the. Oh, okay. But when it comes to the gases, um, unlike little little bit of greenhouse gas accounting, uh, scope one and two are basically the things that your company can make some decisions about those greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. And yeah, inter- it's three, like your internally direct impact from your manufacturing three, process. Yeah. yeah, and scope three is your value chain. Yeah. For most companies, the two biggest pieces are your electricity bill, which is scope two, and the emissions of everything you're purchasing and where it goes after you handle it, which is all in scope three. Up and downstream from the four walls, right? Yeah. At, for Republic, landfills, which are direct control, are are releasing methane. That methane comes as organic materials, as food waste, as paper products break down in our landfills without it in an oxygen poor environment. And the microbes that break that down release methane. Methane is a highly potent greenhouse gas, 25 or 28 times more potent than, than carbon dioxide. Mm. And that's the single biggest piece of our emissions. So that greenhouse gas from purely an emissions reduction standpoint, where in the, the, our customers, the public, regulators in different jurisdictions want to see us reducing those gases. That can be how we cover the landfill, what materials we put on top to, to stop the gases from leaking out. But mm. more, more significantly and uh, more effectively, it's putting pipes in the landfill, sucking that gas out. In some cases, the best thing we can do and this is something that is a reframing from how I thought about what flares are. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. People think flares are really bad. They're actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. If you t- if you take methane gas and you burn it, you that oxidation turns it from methane to CO2. And as I just said, that means it's the, the inverse of you 25 times your, more. You've improved your, your, your greenhouse gas emissions 28x, basically. <laughs> the, the, one, yeah, the impact. Not, yeah, it's a... It's a, a 96 and change percent reduction in, in emissions. Yeah, yeah. But even more, there's an opportunity to monetize that gas, to yes. turn it into energy. Um, there's three general ways that this has been done historically. One is find an, a nearby industrial process, a factory that has a boiler, and they take your gas, they do maybe some light refinements, they burn it, they spin it, they get their energy from your gas. Um, another way is to refine it a little bit more and and create generate electricity that goes either into a nearby microgrid or or work with the utility to get it in the mm, uh, yeah. regular grid. Yeah, and then the the most um, what in this moment is most lucrative based on the way certain incentives work is to refine it so that it's chemically the same as fossil natural gas. So renewable natural gas is this heavily refined landfill gas. Yeah, product. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. not only landfill gas. There's other sources of renewable natural gas. But yeah, you RNG. Amen. Put yeah. that RNG straight into a pipeline, and through the incentive programs, um, natural gas powered vehicles close a loop to enable a credit that says this RNG is actually the fuel that is credited in being in certain natural gas vehicles. And there, there's complexity of mechanisms there, but sure. We, we, about a fifth of our fleet of our we have 17,000 collection vehicles across North America. That's those are your picture, picturing garbage trucks, recycling trucks. We can call them refuse vehicles. <laughs> and you also call it off. Those, you, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. About, about a fifth of those are powered by natural gas, and a hundred percent of that natural gas through this crediting system is tied to RNG production, renewable. That's production. tremendous stuff. That is awesome. That's so. It, it's interesting because you know when when you talk about we you you. you, you in, in the very beginning of this, you you qualified, uh, you know, scope one, scope two, scope three, which I appreciate that very much because a lot of people don't understand that. And I preach all the time. Your scope one is somebody's scope three. So you got to take care of it because those people have to report on what they're doing on their scope three, which is you. 
Um, it, it, it's interesting because it, it seems to me that like Republic Services and, and, and companies like Republic Services of, of you know, similar services um, are in a unique position because if you didn't exist, we'd all be screwed, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, and your scope one is actually our scope one, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, your scope one is there because we have to have you to take our stuff, which is going to, in other words, if I just threw my waste out in my backyard, I'd still be producing that methane, right? And if I give it to you, I'm going to say, hey, here, you take care of it. So you're accepting this stuff to get it done. Whether you're making money in a business of it or not, it's all our issue to help deal with this, right? Because without you, we, we, we just have garbage piled up in the streets, basically. In in parts of the world with less developed waste collection, um, where or no waste collection, the, the yeah. alternative to to b- before landfills, it was just waste dumped dumped in situ where it is, and there it it created health issues. It was an eyesore. It attracted pests, um, both. The little pests that you can't see, and the the bigger ones that still run across some city streets. Um, oh, trust trust me. I I started my logistics career on an open air dock, at a roadway express that was surrounded uh, on three sides by a dump. And in August at ninety degrees, you see some rats running around her sizes of uh, small dogs. It seemed. <laughs> so I, I get what um, you're saying, and yeah. you know what we deal with at OPT, and it is recycling of plastics, et cetera, in locations that still exist in the world. People think this is years and years ago. Most, not most, but a good sized portion of the world still uses like the local stream or river. That's their waste management system. It's still or, happening. Or at best, they use what has been regulated out of most of the developed world, but an open pit landfill. Yeah. Oh yeah, open absolutely. Pit landfill has, has no landfill gas controls. Whatever yeah. methane is produced, just bubbles up to the top and is a major contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions to climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not just the uh, manure pools or ponds and (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Um, But so that, that the opportunities that have come through that reuse that finding again, we could have just said it's landfill. We're done with it. But, by seeing the gas not only as something that we have to deal with, but as a resource, we have um, 70 or so active landfill gas to energy projects. And landfill gas to energy is, is that there's a broader term waste to energy. Typically people yeah. are talking about incineration of. Yeah. Waste. Yeah. That, yeah. People immediately think, well, you, you're burning garbage. That's right. not an activity that Republic engages in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But at, at our landfills, that putting pipes in the ground, capturing the gas, and monetize and and monetizing it, but capturing the value, monetizing the value of it, is something that happens at at, at uh, about seventy of our landfills, and we've got some forty or so projects in the pipeline. Um, a lot of it is with uh, that we announced a couple of years ago a joint venture with. A company named Arkea, which was then acquired by BP, and we had previously developed projects with both independently Arkea and BP. But this this portfolio of renewable natural gas projects in the in that joint venture was the largest ever portfolio of renewable natural gas projects. Oh wow! That was announced, and and that's where it's it's not just money in because of commitment to the cause. It's also money in because there's business, there's dollars and cents business opportunity here. That's something gotcha. that, that happens at the highest levels of our, of our organization, of the, the executives in the organization, the board who oversees, they're in agreement that this is the right thing to do as a business to go yeah, back no. to your earlier frame. So Okay. So let, let me ask you this, you know, we, in, in discussions, and I already know that people are investing in this as well. Maybe not in the United States, but I, I know uh, abroad there's there's people that are investing in um, in, in landfills. Uh, landfills are the are the mines of the future. Um, is that is that really the the turn that that is occurring at Republic? Is that realization that this that is coming in? There's because there's two things here, right? You, you got to deal with this waste that's a problem, 
right? We got to figure it out because the population is growing and the waste problem is just going to get worse. So we got to catch up. And right now we're behind, right? We, 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 there's no doubt we're behind, but we're, we're making steps towards it. There's that, but there's also, like we said before, blue oceans of opportunity. The, the rare earth minerals and, and things that are in those landfills are highly valuable if you can now figure out how to extract those and moving forward, how to process them into these locations so that they're more efficiently extracted. That's the business plan, right? That's the strategy, right? So that conversion. We, we have looked into some of those things on our own. We've had external parties um, approach us. It is something that go back to what does it mean? Is it possible? Is it possible with today's technology and today's economics? When the, the, the situation in which that might be feasible is, or, or the ways in which it's been explored in any commercial sense is taking a, a cell of a landfill, a portion of a landfill that's already closed Mm -hmm. And having someone, we're, it's no longer active. We don't have heavy equipment there. We're not receiving new materials, but a, someone, whether it's us or a third party, could be opening up that cell of the landfill, sifting through the materials there with whatever means they Yeah, they yeah, have, well, it is, and, extracting and something in value. some way, yeah. The component of that process that in some way or another exists today in in some kind of feasibility or seeming feasibility is if you already have the material in the landfill, the waste that's in the landfill um, available to run through a machine and pull out value, that seems to be there. The challenge is that the cap that's on the landfill serves a lot of functions. And when you mm. open up the cap, you create you, you create a lot of environmental challenges, not the uh. least of which is 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 complying with regulations. But if you open up that cap, the methane that's been seeping up to the top could balloon and create a, a massive plume of, of greenhouse gas emitting of, of this heavily potent greenhouse gas. There's yeah, also so there's, there's 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 some technology and steps to be figured out first. Is yeah. what you're trying the, to the, say. The yeah. other thing that really impacts the neighbors of the landfill is that is not an odor neutral situation. <laughs> and that that environment is going to create smell. So I love it, it. it is something that uh, if, if can it be done means can it be done with today's technology in a economically um, viable <laughs> way? We have yet to see that at scale. And, and so that's where that piece sits today. But yeah, so, long I guess, as, I guess. so long as we can manage that material, keep it in the landfill and pull out as much gas as possible, we see that being a pathway to reduce the emissions, avoid uh, straws in um, in in turtles' biology, and keep yeah, it, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, containing it and keeping it from leaching everywhere else is. So, let me ask you this: when when people think about recycling and they think about the waste issue and so on, there are popular things out there, right? And we you alluded to one of them, or it didn't even allude to it. It was right out there in everybody's face, but it went, it might have went right past them. And I've always talked about this as well: is like in transportation, trucking, which was you know, in, in logistics, which was my career for uh, a few decades. Um, you know, they always talk about CO2, 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 but it's the NOx that kills people and it's the, and methane's 28 times worse, right? Um, when you're talking about waste to landfill, right? And people go zero waste to landfill. The biggest issue is not necessarily plastics or metals, right? It is the bio waste, Right. Yeah. That that's the biggest issue in far as volume and environmental impact, correct? That that that's correct. The the carbon in organic materials that's most available for those microbes to break down in the landfill and release the methane is gonna come from food waste. It's gonna come from yeah, whether that's produce or or I mean animal. and it comes from being a kid, you know, don't litter. Well, it's just a banana peel. Oh, okay. It'll just break down. And, and and still people have this mindset. If you're throwing away food waste, it's just going to go break down. Well, it's not good. That's actually probably in many respects worse than the straw. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're talking about it, if it's actually making its way into a landfill, the straw in the landfill is 
going to more or less go nowhere. It's possible that some of what's in the straw as water, as rain comes into the landfill. Yeah, as it breaks down it. over 400 but years, whatever it is. That's why we have the liner and we we treat our leachate. We have many different technologies for, for that treatment and we right. are testing what's coming off. But for, for that food waste diversion, which is what so many organizations are struggling with, it's a problem that we are up up and running, ready ready to address in, in many different contexts. Again, goes back to where are the economics? So in California, there is this SB 1383, uh, a mandate mm-hmm. for food diversion, food waste diversion. We have a robust organics collection and processing business. We have uh, made a lot of investments in the latest technologies to separate the food waste from the non-food waste. There's always contamination in whatever stream we're, we're working in to um, to process the materials, whether it's through tilling, through spinning it and, and creating a um, an environment that does have oxygen, but still has the heat to break, break it down and turn it into some kind of soil amendment, which is maybe a fancy word, word for fertilizer. <laughs> we also are collecting yard waste and wood chips, which there's a wood chip business that, and this is something that you, you don't think of the company that collects your container of uh, waste at home as doing this, but we are dyeing wood chips in, in, in natural, um, with natural pigments that are used for landscaping. And so we're looking for ways to keep these materials and uh, repurpose that, that repurpose, if the wood chips are are um, stable as land chips, land um, excuse me as wood chips in landfill in in landscaping, uh, yeah, that is carbon sequestration. That's carbon that is as this stable wood chip and not back into the atmosphere. Yeah, right. Yeah, so no, for exactly. Burning yard waste would put it straight back into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, we also have invested in anaerobic digestion of food waste, which. There's a lot of things to figure out, but that anaerobic digestion, one of the things that comes off of it is the same feedstock for renewable natural gas that we talked about from the landfill. Yeah. So if you can contain that process, you can process it into a methane gas that you can then collect and then reutilize for RNG. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So where our customers are demanding that we have these services, we are investing in finding the solutions. And where our customers are regulators. So uh, California, yeah, named yeah, it yeah, regulatory yeah. environment. L- lots of parts of the country have a ban on green waste, which is yard waste in, in entering landfills. They're not necessarily easily enforceable, but where there's places where there is an opportunity to separate that waste stream and collect it, we are taking it out of landfill and bringing so, it to. Let, let me ask you this about that because you, you know you talk about a little bit about mandates and and you just mentioned you know banning on on you know green waste from yards and stuff like that. So, are are we on the right are, are we on the right path or what's what's your opinion on accessibility versus mandating? Right, which comes first? Because if you build the accessibility, because, you you know, I, Republic Service is a business and I don't fault in any way at all because OPT that I run is a business. And so if it's not going to make money, we're not going to do it. Right. We're just trying to build people's awareness that, hey, you can actually make money and do recycling. Right. It doesn't have to be just a cost drain. Same thing with Republic Service. You're not going to build this stuff and then hope that it's there. The demand needs to be there for you to be able to do certain things. Do mandates help that or do they hurt and cause pressure to move forward? Like if I, if I can't get rid of my yard waste, what the heck am I going to do? I'm burn it. Yeah. It, there, there, there definitely are regulations that are more effective and less effective. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't have the numbers on what that, uh, efficacy looks like, but if you're, if, a regulation comes into place. One of the the characterization of California's um, food waste diversion mandate is an yeah. unfunded mandate. It's a requirement that a thing happens. A requirement that you will have a penalty if you don't do this thing. You will you, you will pay a fine as a business, as a as a um, housing complex, uh, as uh, 
some entity, you will pay a fine if you're not diverting your food waste, but there's not a pool of funds to invest in this infrastructure. <laughs> you would think As it should be, it. you'd think the fines might do that. <laughs> would, so, shouldn't the fines be so, creating so that fund? The, 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 that is the intent. And that's the way yeah. that, that the, the law was um, created on the question of, do you need access first or do you need the mandate first or do you need the funding first? If, if a rule is put up in a way that creates a sufficient runway that says three years from now, that's when the ban starts. And yeah. the, the burden of the fine is on the waste producer, meaning n- not us as the ones who are handling the waste, but our customers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that is on business. them. Yeah, we actually one we've seen the ability to, and, and not just we've seen the ability. I, I I believe this is actually part of the the rule is that waste um, the, the haulers and the waste manage the, the companies that are handling those materials uh, have an incentive, if not our own mandate, to provide support and guidance and expertise to our customers. So we have roles in California um, called sustainability advisor, where they are at the ready, fully knowledgeable, far more knowledgeable than I am on the ins and outs of that SB 1383, the law that, that said this mm. out. Mm-hmm. answering customer questions. It, it's a sales adjacent role that says, you want to make sure you're complying? Well, here are the services that will allow you to comply. You need new containers. You need um, to, you're interested in the weights on those materials. You want to understand what the end use is. You want to be able to tell the story of the impacts. If you're, if you're mandated to do this thing, you want to be able to get credit for it. That that all comes through our support of of our customers of the marketplace. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, the, you know, that story now that, that can really effectively be used a, a, and become an actual asset on the books for, for, for companies, right. That story you, you're, you're talking about is now becoming mandated. And California is one of the first to do that, right. If you even imply you've got to have the backup that it's happening, it's not good enough to yeah. just say, well, Mike Schwartz and the boys at Republic take my stuff. No, yeah. you have to have the proof from them as well right? Uh, to be able to do that. So we've, we've beaten bio and green waste to, to death. And because I just wanted to make the point out there to people that there's far, there, there are huge complicated, it's just not figuring out plastics and metal and, 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 and hazmat and chemicals. Our food is a huge issue. The food waste is a huge issue that companies like Republic Service are, are, are dealing with. But you guys are doing something really, really interesting, and it's and it's what brought us together basically. Because my passion is is plastics, trying to help out plastics in areas where um, it, it it isn't economically viable for a behemoth to go in and actually provide services for recycling plastics. Right? It's there, there's reasons why our plastics recycling rates are very low, and they're mostly economic. Uh, barriers that 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 make that happen, and so you guys are doing some interesting things to try and break down that and improve that. So let's jump into that a little bit because um, time is running, and this is a really important subject that I really want to hit on, uh, Mike. So uh, polymer centers. Uh, I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday who's a, a big, uh, big, big uh, auto repair company that is. We had toured it in out in Vegas and said it's just fantastic. Let's talk about this a little bit. What is this initiative that's actually been going on for a, a couple of year, a number of years now, right? So the I, I want to talk um, one one comment about the low recycling rate of plastic. Yeah, in please. The U.S. Yeah, the, it got a lot of attention. It was on you know some, the, some of the late night shows and uh, news shows talking about a, a very small, I think it was a single digit percentage of plastic in the U.S. is recycled. That's the stat. Yeah. That, that means certain things and it doesn't mean other things. The biggest thing it means is most plastic by weight in, um, in the U.S. is soft plastic, film plastic, plastic bags. Yes. And that is a material that today is not widely commercially recyclable. So that that's the, right. that's the, before you start even talking about 
the recycling system as it exists. It's right. But the majority of plastic isn't even eligible to enter that system as it exists. Again, economic feasibility. Put that aside. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the plastic that does get recycled is because of recycling. If there, It's not that if you, if you put plastic, if you put rigid plastic in a recycling container, that plastic will be processed through and sold to eventually sold to someone who is reusing it in some way or another. Right. And so if we didn't exist, if we, if we shuttered our operations tomorrow, whatever that percent is would precipitously fall. And we're talking. Yeah. About- and, that, and that's no, it, it, you're, you're making a very, very valid point. And you're, you're absolutely right. Perfectly clear. If you put it in the recycling bin or hand it to Republic services to recycle it, it's going to be recycled. It isn't 6% of that that's being recycled. It's 6% of all that is available. That's not, it's the 94% that's not even getting to you guys. Right. And, and that's the reason that I, that's the issue. Yeah. The, the, that means a couple different things. It, it, one of the the challenges, and I look for this in every every building that I go in. I yeah look to see if they're recycling, and if the recycling is there a recycling container next to every single trash container, every single right. otherwise landfill container. If there isn't, then most people aren't going to walk around with their empty bottle and wait until they find the right container. If they right, the right. container that they see is where they're going to put it. So right. that's one of the problems with the bigger problem in this country is that the um, vast majority of buildings are not serviced by recycling. And yeah, I, I'm naming that. Well, let's earmark that and we'll probably come back to it. Okay. But th- this polymer center uh, network that you named. Yeah. We as a company saw that there are consumer product goods companies with goals for minimum recycled content that they, whether it's 30% by 2025 or 100% by 2025 or by 2030, the volumes of recycled content at the appropriate quality to feed that demand were not there. When we talk about us as a recycler, before the polymer centers, recycling in North America meant a company collected plastic, metal, paper products, separated them and crushed them together in, or put, put, uh, compressed them together in what's called a bale, a, a block of more or less like materials. In a yeah. lot of places, that's a block of mixed rigid plastic, mixed different different types of plastics. That's your water bottle, which is probably PET, your laundry detergent bottle, which might is probably HDPE, some polypropylene. Mm-hmm. And then it gets sold as that block of mixed material. Yeah. The polymer center said, well, actually, that's not good enough to get this back into the plastic bottle at the, the, seat, the, the beverage company that has this goal to have minimum recycled content. Most of that time where you have that mixed plastic, it's not refined enough. It has different colors. And so it's something that can be used for pipe. It can be used for carpet, it can be used for pillow fill. Maybe if you've seen those park benches that um, have flex of different materials in them, that's because that comes from mixed yeah. plastic. Po- like, uh, uh, the, the, like a polywood material and stuff like that. It, it is yeah, recycling, it, but it's downcycling. It's, it's, it, exactly. And you want to upcycle or, or level cycle as much as possible before you get to that, right? It is a great thing to create that one more life. This, this plastic yeah, bottle sure. gets that one more life rather, and that one more life is a durable one more life. It's not a single use as the bottle was in the right. first case. But wouldn't it be amazing if that bottle could become a bottle again? And if these, if these um, CPG companies have these goals that are out there, that they're, they're on the line to deliver on these goals, isn't there proof of demand? So Polymer yes. Center, the first Polymer Center, which has been running since um, late last year, is in Las Vegas. Mm. There's going to be at least four. The second one um, is under construction in Indianapolis. There's going to be one on the East Coast, one in the South. There, there might be more than that. We're, we're 
looking at where, where the economics are, where the demand is, that facility takes it wet, like the, 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 the idea is take that plastic bottle, that PET bottle, and it enters the polymer center, maybe with a mixed stream of different plastics together, maybe with different colors together. But when it leaves, it is a refined product, a, a washed and shredded flake that then can be sold to a plastic manufacturer as a feedstock. As and, and it, but, it, but and you're separating it. You're separating it into the specific uh, ricks, but further to color because that's what people don't understand. You can't take a, 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 a you can't take red, blue, and green and make a clear bottle out of it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Doesn't right. have, yeah. make it when they're mixed, the only thing you can do is maybe gray or brown or, or mostly black is what you're going to get right. So, and that's so part they, of the they, issue with recycling is the demand for natural or clear plastic so that the CPG can then present their marketing on their packaging, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. And and that that process is something that the the the, the thesis is a plastic enabling a plastic bottle to become a plastic bottle, enabling yes. every every type of plastic to leave the polymer center with the highest value that the that the market is demanding. And so that it will be that at least level level um, use where it, it comes out as it came in. And when we went to the, when we went to um, potential customers, we found that the demand ready to go at the pricing that we were talking about was maybe five or six times what the volume out of that first polymer center was going to be. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And no, that, it, that's it, why it, I it, talked it's, about it's definitely there. And that's why I talked about that network. So this network, it's it's a hub and spoke network where that Vegas polymer center is going to be receiving, is receiving all of our plastics from the Western US and um, a substantial amount of third party volumes of plastics. There's a lot of recycling companies that their next best end use is going to be to come through us. They want in, they want to say they're part of this more circular model. And um, that regional, that hub and spoke model is going to exist everywhere. And that means that our recycling centers can actually maybe slow down to be a little less refined in, in how much investment is needed at each recycling center to mm. separate those materials, to have them as otherwise high value pre polymer center world, high value as possible. They can go to so, the polymer center and that's where the, the refinement can continue. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask is, is why does a new infrastructure have to, be in place for this to work. Yeah. I mean, th this, this investment, this innovation marks the first time that a company in North America is manning, managing the plastics recycling stream from collection of spent packaging to this high quality color sorted, often washed and flaked material that manufacturers can use in a in a more streamlined way without needing secondary yeah. processing there are places th this is a vertical integration and it, it's an activity that in some ways is happening elsewhere but in our it, it takes us being as large as we are with the volumes that we already control and the breadth of our reputation and name that can attract other third-party volumes mm -hmm. to be able to do this it's, it's an aggregation problem to to spend the the tens of millions of dollars to build one of these facilities and not have the volume that um, enables it to be as valuable as possible just wouldn't have worked. And so that, right. that is why this innovation really changes things and the quality of what's coming out of the, of the polymer center, the, the, the Vegas location that's up and running, we're being told by our customers, we have never seen anything like this. Yeah, and and that and, 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 and that is the key. You you have to have the quality out of it, and that's what makes it so difficult when you have. So is it is it still um, the ability to bring in single stream all the plastics together, and then you're doing the separation after at the processing? That to to be perfectly honest, I'm a little removed and don't know the current state, the exact current state. But that, gotcha. that that's that's where we're going. That's what it, yeah. if that isn't what it is yet, and I, and I. I, I got I'm you. not exactly sure the current state, but th that's the eventual that we can take 
mixed PTHTP polypropylene. Yeah, because I mean, and, the goal is you've got to have that infrastructure like you're talking about there to create the volumes and the quality of plastics that manufacture CPG. Uh, and quite frankly, it doesn't even have to be CPG. There's there's a bunch of others that you have to have specific plastics and they have to be fairly high quality in order for them to use it as recycling because the very public that is demanding um, recycling and recycled content also demands the quality and the functionality of that product. And so you... you, you the, and regulators... Like, Food grade is not a light term to be thrown around, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. FDA letter of non-objection is not, you don't just get one of those walking down the street. It's it's not an easy thing to get. Um, and, and they're just now becoming a little bit more common, right? As people are figuring out how to get it done. Um, but the, the convenience of participating is also something is needed is is the the hub and spoke system kind of outside or even if it's just an adjustment of internal structure of republic service is something you're focusing on as well to make it as easy as possible to get that piece of plastic out of mike vincent's hand into your system right because even like you said it comes down to if i'm sitting in my cubicle in a company that has a recycling bin right down the hall but I've got a trash can right here. Yeah. I'm more likely going to put my plastic right in that trash can. That's never even going to see that recycling bin. That's maybe 50 feet away. Yeah. Yeah. That that's definitely part of the system. And there, there is a lot, there's a lot of yet to be fully explored or matured of what can happen in our relationships with our customers that changes their behavior that makes them want to put as much of the plastic in the recycling container as possible. Right. Well, uh, you talked about it before, shrinking that value chain helps, right? When you can shrink that value chain, like you're doing at the polymer centers, that means there's more uh, wealth that upside. can be distributed yeah. and and therefore incentivize uh, people, right? And and I want to, that, that's a, a great segue. To, I, I do want to name that. The two, the first two customers that were announced first was yeah. Please do. Yeah. We're running out of time. Let's get those guys on here and 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 hear it. First, What's going first on? was Coca Cola, and then was Circularix, which is a, a Macquarie backed venture on on plastic circularity. The Macquarie, big name, Coca Cola, big name. They're bought in. They wanted a massive amount of volume, and we said that we got to leave some some for the other folks. Um, but there's also an additional vertical integration on top of this, which is a, a joint venture between us and plastic manufacturer Rivago. That joint venture is called Blue Polymers. The yep. first Blue Polymer uh, facility is co-located with the Indianapolis Polymer Center. And so that's also under construction today. And that's going to be taking some of the volume of the Polymer Center. So we're bought into not just creating the raw material, but also a a contained product that is ready to be used with whoever's branding wants it and to be right on. And, 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 and at NPE, uh, just a few weeks ago, they announced, I, I think there's going to be another one in, in Buckeye, Arizona, outside of Phoenix. That's yeah. That's the second blue polymers yeah. location. Yeah. 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 Very uh, cool. Here, here in the Phoenix area. And, and, Very um, cool. I, the, the, another teaser of an announcement came out several months ago where our, our CEO at, at Plastics Conference shared that this model is not unique. Is not There is something about this hub and spoke model of a company that has the ability to aggregate like we do that is not unique to these rigid plastics. And that's about as much as was said that other the other plastics are ones that, that um, are, are in our sites. But we are looking for ways to extend this, maximize the value, bring materials back in at their at their highest level of performance, um, and and this is the beginning. This is just the beginning. Yeah, excellent stuff. Hey, we are uh, we're out of time there, Mike. So uh, I, I'm going to leave it there unless you got something else to say because that was a that was a tremendous wrap up. Well, for anybody. Uh, one one other shout out that uh, for yeah, do it. Green, Green Biz in February here in Phoenix, uh, the the big truck that was there with our with our name on it is okay. 
the first North American built for purpose electric refuse collection vehicle um, built by McNeilis, who we worked very closely with in the specification of that vehicle. We've got them running regular routes, and that's part of our industry leading commitment to electrify our fleet. And that's just one of the other ways where we see total cost of ownership as speaking for itself. And that's a value add for our customers that, that we want to, um, that, that we're already seeing them agree that the value add is there. So yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yeah. 17,000 vehicles, dude, you got a carbon footprint you got to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you got to take care of your own carbon footprint while you're taking care of our fart carbon footprint. Right. I mean, that's, that's basically what you guys are doing. And I, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate you coming on because people need to understand, um, you know, what is going on there and the efforts that are going on there. And I really appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have you on again, uh, as things progress and, uh, Hey, God bless you, my friend. Great work. Thank you. You got it, brother. Hey, um, everybody, thank you for tuning in and uh, downloading Sustainiacs. Uh, This is Mike Vincent. Peace and love, everybody. We'll talk to you again soon.